All right. Welcome back, everyone. Thank you for staying with us and going with the flow with the schedule change. But we're happy to present our next company. We have Digital Brands Group, Inc. It trades on the NASDAQ under the symbol DBGI. It is a digitally native first vertical brand offering a wide variety of apparel through numerous brands on a both direct to consumer and wholesale basis. Joining us is the CEO, Hill Davis, as well as the Chief Marketing Officer, Laura Dowling. Welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having us. All right. We look forward to your presentation. The floor is yours when you're ready. Great. Sounds thank good. you. All right. So the goal of this is uh, threefold. The first is we want to lay out who we are, why we think there is an opportunity, and how we are solving it. Number two is we're going to discuss, and this is probably most important for most of the people on this call, our three short and long-term business drivers, which are as follows. One, acquisition growth two, organic growth, and three, margin expansion. And then finally, we're going to open it up to the floor for Q&A. We're going to shoot for 10 to 15 minutes there. So with that, let's, we're going to click over to the slides and start on the first slide. So what, who are we? Digital Brands Group is basically what we think is the updated version of the portfolio concept. And do you want to talk about that a little bit? Sure. Basically, essentially, we're building on what traditional luxury brands have done many years prior. We are a portfolio in that we have a multitude of brands underneath us. We're a holding company, so we have some brands that specialize in handbags, others in denim, um, some in children's wear, just giving you some examples there. Yep. And so we think there's an opportunity to basically reshape that traditional holding company because the way the world is with direct consumer. So along those lines, aligns, what we believe is that traditional wholesale is broken as is. The department stores, the opening thousands and thousands of stores, it does not work because 30 to 40 percent of your e-commerce, of your sales is coming from e-commerce. So those stores are less and less profitable. Mm -hmm. Interesting, Nordstrom just reported yesterday and said 46 percent of their revenue is now online. That's pretty significant for one of the largest department stores out there. And then the other thing is digital only brands can't make it work because the cost to acquire customers in the digital world is too high. The retention is too low. And so I think this is really critical is that both models now have broken, but there is actually a model that works going forward, which we believe we've tapped into. And I think this is really critical. And that is that we think of the portfolio fans at brands as a closet share. So when you walk out of your closet, you might be wearing six or seven items of clothing represented by five to seven brands. Our goal is to be two or three of those brands. That's really key. And you want to talk about the customer data and then... Yeah, essentially, we, as I just building off of what I said prior, we we are a holding company in that we have we also have shared surfaces on the back end. But what that also enables us to do too is that when we have these different brands and we have consumers shopping these brands, we're able to gather data on these shoppers. Then we then take that data and we create clusters of different types of people that we want to then market to, and we're able to make customized content based on their user preferences that we find from the data. It's really important because we can take one product and shoot it in seven different style cohorts. So it could be pair of denim that's shot to look prep or streetwear or lead or goth or tailored. And then based on the data that we have, we can send that person that look that's very specific to their style. So I'm not a streetwear person. So I wouldn't get looks that look streetwear more like tailored. And then original founders, Corey and Mark would get more streetwear looks. And so I think this is really critical. And this is kind of the holy grail of e-commerce is because you have the data, you can create more and more personalized looks. And the more brands we have, the more personalized looks we can create and the more data. So it becomes like that flywheel that Amazon's famous for that once you're in our ecosystem, you stay in because of all the hooks we can bring to that, especially around personalization and clothing. Uh, obviously, one of the big pieces is we own the margin stack. So we get both the wholesale and the retail markup. And I think that's really important because I do think it changes the profitability of the business. And we look at everything as needing a 50% contribution margin, which should lead us to 15 to 20% EBITDA margins over the next three to five years. And then cost synergies and margin expansion. We bought Bailey's 44 in February of last year right before COVID hit, which if you look at our S1, definitely had an impact on the business. But I think what's interesting there is if you look at where it was pre-COVID, you look at where it was in 2020 during COVID, and you look at what we're seeing today, 
it is a COVID impact. And when COVID is behind us, as it is now, for how people are acting, the vaccines, guess what comes with orders, revenues, customers, and we're seeing that. And so that's one of the organic growth things we'll talk about. But we stripped $7 million of operating costs out of that business. And I think that's really critical because we can take that revenue and make it flow through at a much, much higher profitability. I think that's really critical. I think we kind of talked on some of these. One of the things I want to talk about here that I think is really important, and I think this goes back to how are we different? There are two ways we're significantly different. One is we don't think about being omnichannel. That's table stakes. The first piece is you acquire in the physical and you retain in the digital. And I think this is really critical because what we're learning is that acquiring in digital is very expensive. The return rate's high, the repeat's low, the loyalty's low. But if you acquire in the physical where they're touch, see, feel, and fit your brand, then they stick digitally because they know the brand. It's no different than what J. Crew did when they went from a catalog business to a store business. The difference is we think you want to take this awesome department store and boutique world that's already been set up and scale into that because you're making 50 to 60% margins on that and your incremental cost is de minimis because you've already got a sales team set up to do this. And so we really believe that it's not about omni-channel, it's about acquiring in the physical, leveraging a massive network of department stores and boutiques and then retain them with digital with the personalized looks and feels. Mm -hmm. And to that point, Laura's going to touch on, we did some of this cross promoting and cross styling, like we talked about where we took a brand distilled and we took another brand Bailey's and we mixed tops and bottoms. And Laura, you want to talk about kind of what we saw? We were able to incrementally increase growth. As you see on the slide here, we had a 400% increase in sales across, across certain SKUs, 71% other SKUs. We were able just through re-merchandising the product and being more focused on customer styles versus brand point of view, we were able to increase sell through. Um, so as you see in these slides, I have, I have a couple different case studies, whether they're ads or emails. Again, leveraging the data, leveraging what we know about these consumers, we're able to mix the brands and put together looks that had both Distilled and Bailey 44, two brands in our portfolio, to increase sell through and also open Open up a new customer base. We expose expose Bailey 44 customers to distilled and vice versa. You know where maybe historically they wouldn't have looked at that brand at all. They just saw it in a different look. Here you can just see some other really great quick wins. You know my team taking over Bailey 44 as Hill just mentioned a year ago. You know totally re-merchandising the product, getting better photographers, really putting together um, some great content um, immediately drives a nice lift. I think that's really important. One of the questions we get asked is why did we go public so early? And we can talk about that uh, as we go into the three drivers. But let me just go back to point one, which is who, where, who we are, why we think we have an opportunity, and then how we're executing on it. So you kind of heard how we're executing on it. I think the big thing is when you think about the traditional holding company, where it's VF Corp, LVMH, there's PVH, there's Tapestry, there's Capri Holdings. What's interesting, they're just the sum of the revenues of the brands with some synergies. We actually believe that the future is actually taking these brands and almost creating a hybrid between a department store model where you're putting together looks and styles for those customers based on their data. So now it's getting a very personalized feel when you get an email from us. Because when you get an email from a brand, it's the same brand from head to foot. That's not how the customer buys. They're wearing multiple brands. So we now become the new Nordstrom's. We become the solve for that. And we own all those brands and we're getting the margin stack. So it's not just the sum of the revenues, it's the cross marketing of these brands in a very personalized, customized format. And you can see from the data lift that we're getting, it's really significant. And then number two is also the fact that we get these massive savings. And in fact, you get more savings because when you're direct consumer first, you don't have these massive staffs to do certain things on the back end. And I think that's really critical. The other thing too, is we're all using the same systems. Like when we look at DTC companies, they're using like a Shopify plus, they're using a NetSuite. They're all on the same backend platform so we can aggregate those under one contract, which really adds up, makes it a lot easier to do. But when you look at more wholesale brands, they're using all different systems. So we just migrate those to the new systems and we know how to do that. And I think that's really critical. So that's how we're different than the portfolio company. But I think it's kind of where the world's gone. The customer's gone. They don't want to necessarily go into store, which I think is what you're seeing, but they still want that personalized content, those styles and their looks that are for them based on their style preference. 
preferences, we're filling that void where the other portfolio companies are just like, here's my brand X, here's my brand Y, here's my brand Z. They're not integrating them. So number two is what are the short and long-term drivers? As I've talked about, there are three, acquisition growth, organic growth, and margin expansion. Acquisition growth. If you go through our S1, we talk very specifically that we are an acquisition company. For those of you who aren't aware, when you're going through an S1, you can't try to work deals while you're going through the S1 because then you need to include them into your pro forma, even if the deal has not happened. So we had to walk away from all deal talks during the S1 process. As you can imagine, being public, we plan to be very acquisitive. And these acquisitions will be, based on our conversations, very accretive to investors. And we plan to move fast and swiftly and be smart because that's why we went public. We went public to have a currency to acquire these companies. We had a ton of companies that love this model and love what we're doing. But until we could give them public stock, they were not interested because they don't want private stock. They either want public stock or cash. Going public allows us to pursue this acquisition engine. In fact, one of our board members owns two amazing, beautiful brands, and he had sold two great brands to VF Corp a while ago called Splenda and Ella Moss. He has two brands right now. You can imagine we're excited about him joining the board and what he can bring, both from his experience, but also imagine his brands. And so as you think about it, as we move from our IPO, which was a couple of weeks ago, uh, about a, a week and a half ago, through the next 30 to 45 days, we do plan to show that we are an acquisition engine. And we think that is really critical. And the more brands we have in our portfolio, the more customized and personalized our content can get from mm -hmm. customers, yeah. and the more specific our looks can get as well, which is really powerful. So acquisitions are a massive piece of our business because that creates the flywheel that creates a stickiness with the customers. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Organic growth, perfect example. Let's take each brand, Bailey's, which is our biggest brand, pre-COVID doing 27 million, post-COVID doing in the low seven and a half because we also changed designers uh, right before COVID. So we didn't bring a new designer back. Product just started shipping this month for the first time in 15 months. So you can kind of figure out when you look at the retail world and what's going on, pre-COVID numbers, COVID numbers, and then what post-COVID's looking like. I will say that the new designers we have at Bailey's are doing an amazing job. The market reaction has been amazing. And we are entering the post-COVID world that everyone else is entering. And we're really excited about that organic growth. And Laura's going to really focus on a bit doing photo shoots to turn all this mm -hmm. content. This, did, this company did not have a lot of e-commerce revenue, but we actually know it can based on some stuff we did during the fall mm -hmm. on this new product. So we're excited about not only the wholesale business, but also the e-commerce business that the, this brand's never really had, but we know how to do it. And we've already seen some of the success cross-marketing between Distilled mm -hmm. and Bailey's. Regarding Distilled, we haven't spent a dollar on marketing in the last two years. So think about that. We haven't spent a dollar on marketing in the last two years for Distilled. So imagine going forward, what the IPO allowed us to do was bring in marketing dollars. So I can tell you this person here to the right of me is incredibly excited to really <laughs> get back yeah. in the marketing game. Yeah, get back in the marketing game. I mean, when I first joined the group and I was working just specifically on Distilled, because that's the brand that brought us all together, DSTLD, it's a denim brand. We saw over a three-month period, month over month, a 2.9% X type of growth. Um, it's been over March, March, April, April, May, mm -hmm. not year over year, but sequential yeah. month to month. Month to month, a three-time return lift. Um, oh, and yeah. On revenue just by totally cleaning out when we were advertising to the wrong groups, you know, making our advertising dollars work better, having our content be stronger, you know, getting on the right channels, you know, increasing the consistency we had on emails, increasing our digital ad spend in the places that made sense, you know, really, really being smart about our spend. So, and that was just in a three month time period. And now this IPO and having more liquidity, just think of, you know, the world is our oyster. There's a lot we can do there. It was exciting, too, because we saw it live in real time, week to week. We saw we're profitable in the first acquisition. So that works even. So you're scaling into profitable first-time acquisitions. And we know what it looks like with marketing dollars. And also during Laura's tenure when she first came, we also really focused on repeat and doubled our repeat rate. So all these things are really happening. And Harper & Jones, which is a uh, men's custom clothing showroom model, high-end clients, Cliff Kingsbury, you've got uh, Common, you've got a lot of other 
athletes and celebrities and things like that. Opening additional showrooms, they have three. It takes about $125,000 to open a showroom. It generates $250,000 in first year cash. So that's a that's basically a, a huge cash on cash return. We know we can dial that up. We've got market selected. Again, no funds can't open stores. With funds, you can. We're also going to launch a readywear program there. We're working with Laura Piana and their fabrics, and it's really exciting to do. That's a really high-end brand. And there's also a lot of wholesale brands that now want to carry this ready-to-wear line for Harper & Jones in, into next year. So when you think about the organic drivers, You've got new product categories for some brands. You've got post-COVID versus during COVID. And again, the S1 numbers are in there. So you can get an idea of what the drop-off was and then what we would expect to achieve in the next two years with that brand. And then finally, you also have no marketing, finally turning on the marketing spigot, and we know it works. We know it works from cross-merchandising, as we showed you. We know it works from just a brand sequential month-over-month -month increase. So you've got significant and swift acquisition growth coming. You've got organic growth coming through the back half of this year, both from marketing as well as new product development, new stores for a Harper & Jones model, which is about 1,100 square foot store. And then you've got margin expansion. As we get into these brands, we're really able to cut a lot of cost where there's overlap or where there's just too many people, but also we're able to leverage Laura's team in marketing, mm -hmm. Reed's team in finance, who is our CFO, to basically sit over the brand. So each brand doesn't have a CMO and a CFO. It, it has, you can go down lower. So you're saving these significant costs. So where normally a brand would have to probably spend a million and a half to two million just to get to the next level of growth, mm -hmm. that's already that's already exists within our current uh, org chart and human stack. So yeah. I think that's a really big deal. And so I think those are the three drivers. We do, we will be uh, cash flow neutral as our three brands with the acquisitions that we would expect to announce and, and make over the course of this year will be nicely EBITDA positive. So again, significant growth, both organic and via acquisitions, and then also EBITDA positive for the year. So I think that's all really positive. And I will tell you that we have never seen more acquisition flow. We're probably turning down three deals a week. I mean, everyone's looking to sell coming out of COVID because it just shook everyone up. And the wholesale brands need to sell in and build out direct, which they don't want to do because it's the massive investment cycle. The DTC brands realize they've got to build wholesale and they don't know how to do it. And then a lot of the people that are just owned by the founders, they just don't want to go through this again. So they, everyone's looking to sell. And that's really, really positive for us, especially because we become the home that everyone wants to come to because we're not traditional finance people. We're also operators. And so they know here that we can really build great brands together and not financial engineer the company. So with that, let's open it up for Q&A. Great presentation, you guys. Uh, yes, we have lots of questions for you. Let's begin. So how many brands or types of clothing do you have under you currently and where are your greatest margins? Yeah, so we have three brands right now, which are Distilled, which is a streetwear brand. Mm -hmm, Distilled. We have Bailey 44, which is a women's contemporary brand. And we have Harper & Jones, which is a higher end bespoke men's suiting brand. And to give you an idea, I think we probably need to add four to seven this year to continue to grow the portfolio. Perfect. And then the greatest margins are both, well, distilled is predominantly e-commerce, but we are launching, there's a lot of demand for that in wholesale. So that has really high gross margins, but with pick, pack, and ship, obviously the contribution margins around the 50s. We, uh, interesting enough with wholesale, you kind of end up hitting the same contribution margin. So I think when you look across the brands right now, it still probably has slightly higher margins, but lower distribution. As we ramp that distribution, mm -hmm. you'll see the margins come down to a Bailey's, but we look for a 50% contribution margin, 20% to marketing. That leaves you 30%. So then you have 15 for GNA and hopefully 15% EBITDA. So what? where do the majority of your sales take place? What percentage is online? So each brand's different. So it's still, it's 100% online. Starting next year, that'll change. There will be wholesale. I'd probably say around 15 to 20%, uh -huh. but significant growth there and great accounts. Whole, uh, Bailey's right now, it's about 90% wholesale, 10% mm -hmm. e-commerce. Yep. I expected this year to kind of be 80, 20, and next year, 65, 35 wholesale yep. e-commerce. Mm -hmm. And then uh, Harper & Jones is 100% custom right now. So that's all through their showrooms or their reps because it is custom. Um, with ready to wear, we expect that to change. The first ready to wear program launches this fall. The 
people are really excited about it, the reps and some of the customers we've previewed it with. So I would expect that to also kind of be an 80-20 next year, uh, basically where you have some wholesale on the 20% and direct at 80. So you just raised 10 million. Um, what What is the main use of the proceeds and will that hold you off from another raise over the next 12 or 24 months? Yeah, so as far as the 10 million, that does get us that and being able to run these business cash flow positive. We would need any additional uh, working capital from that standpoint where we would is with acquisitions, but those would be accretive. So if we do raise capital, it will be for acquisitions and if they will be accretive. And most of the brands we're looking at are in deep talks with, they're anywhere from, most of them tend to be about 70% wholesale, 30% e-commerce. And these brands set up to be uh, 50% wholesale, 50% e-commerce next year, in our opinion. What type of companies are you targeting for acquisition? Do you have any specific genre you're looking for? No, we're pretty open. We, we think about closet share, how we can make that uh, outfits and styles look. So we're trying to be pretty tight there. Uh, so it's predominantly in apparel. There's a lot of great leisure brands right now. Um, there's, uh, there's also some interesting menswear brands and women's wear brands. So we kind of really look at it to make sure it looks, when we're looking at beauty, we think there are actually three legs to our stool. There's apparel, there's beauty, and there's home. Um, we are, we're in some really interesting talks with some home companies right now, as well as some beauty companies. So we would, but if we, I think we go into uh, something like home, especially we'd go in with a major significant, almost like group of brands instead of a single brand to really have scale right away in home. Uh, can you hash out some of the differences between beauty kind and digital brands direct to consumer approach? Yeah, so beauty kind had a 5% give back and we were a reseller of brands in the beauty space. So we resold the Estee Lauder products and L'Oreal products. Here, we actually own the brands. So there's no resell. In fact, we're selling into a wholesaler who would then turn around and resell our product. Perfect. So for future acquisitions, what percentage would you like to use as far as stock versus cash? And do you think the stock at 30 million market cap is too undervalued here to use more stock? Well, so I think two things. One is I think a lot of it also depends on the acquisition. Some of them want more cash than equity. Some want more equity than cash. So I think you're going to be in a range just depending upon the target itself of what that looks like. In terms of market caps, actually a little bit off. It doesn't include options and warrants. We're in discussion with NASDAQ and everything think about that because you do have to expense those. So they that does not include options and warrants. And so that will be rectified. Um, regarding if it's too small of a market cap, it's, it's not really about market cap. It's about accretive or non-accretive. So the question is, are these going to be accretive acquisitions or non-accretive? And they'll be accretive which means we're buying them for less than what we're worth in terms of a multiple basis. And I think that's really key because you have to scale at some point. And so you're going to use that currency. So you want it to be accretive versus non-accretive initially, or worst case, if it's not, which is none of the deals we're in right now, they would have to be accretive within 12 to 18 months based on what you think you can bring to the table. So that's how we look at it because otherwise you could never scale. I mean, going public, I mean, we literally had to walk away from five acquisitions before we went public because everyone wanted us to be public first before we would finalize the deals. Are you planning on using any celebrity influencers? Oh, yeah, for sure. We're definitely going to use and leverage the power of celebrity. Um, we'll have them on the individual brands. And I think maybe also with DBG, too. We definitely want to tap into the right celebrities, for sure. Yeah. What kind of budget do you have for that? I think it's going to be based on brand on brand and do you do equity versus cash. I think mm -hmm. what you got to be really careful about with these celebs is I think the ones that have really worked are ones where the celeb is the center of the brand, whether it's uh, Jessica Alba with Honest Company or um, Cody Hunt's daughter. Uh, 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 Kate Hudson with, uh, yeah, her. Mm -hmm. I think when you see the celeb, they're just getting paid to do a post every now and then. It doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so it, it really needs to be more of a intrinsic partnership that's at its core versus just flash. Otherwise, you just use the influencer world. Yeah. I understand that. So there's a lot of questions about your competitors. So are there any mm -hmm. companies structured like digital brands that get customers in the physical and grow in the digital? And is a fashion, do you feel that fashion is expected to make a comeback with the loosening of COVID restrictions? You talked about that in the beginning, but explain that a little bit more. Yeah, I'll talk about the second person and come back. So yeah, I mean, I think we're definitely seeing that. I think we're seeing it move 
away from leisure. I think leisure will still be relevant. I think athleisure will always be relevant. Yes. Um, yeah, I mean, we're seeing dress come back. I mean, we're seeing it in everything we're looking at. Bailey's 44, which is the category is called date night. So date night and COVID is not a great mix. Um, however, date night post COVID is a great Incredible mix. Yes. 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 So you could imagine with what in denim, denim's been yep. really dead. But yep. now if you look, denim's really coming back. We're seeing a lot of pent up demand across all the brands for sure. All of yeah. yeah. Even custom. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think we we look at a balance. And as far as like every brand that sells in a wholesale is a competitor. But as far as them putting together in a holding company, I think we're the first ones kind of going after this approach. We know there are a bunch of DTC brands that were trying to do this. One of them actually uh, just put themselves up for sale. They wanted to do this whole concept. And what they found, same thing, is they couldn't get brands to come on board because they were private. So I think the biggest opportunity is now that we're public, there's this basically massive dam of brands that have been trying to do the same thing but no one would agree to come together as privately held companies because who gets what shares, who shares are worth what, all these becomes arbitrary on the public market. Now they're like, okay, flip over to us. Cause they're like, you can make us go fast. And I think that's, what's really exciting as far as like, uh, I think there are two holding company models are the ones we've created. Mm -hmm. And well, there's actually three, there's one like authentic brand group where they do a lot more licensing. We're not licensing brands. And then the third is like your VF Corp, your LVMH, your PVH or tapestry, but those are just wholesale brands first. And so they're predominantly 80% wholesale and they're just uh, like us just buying brands and then each brand doing their own thing. Mm -hmm. And we're not cross marketing. Right. We're doing the cross marketing similar to a department store, like a Nordstrom. Yeah. And you're not just focusing on women. You're focusing on men and women, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Though we think women's women's definitely the bigger part of the of the business for sure. Women's, I think, has the larger addressable market. And also there's the virality component to the sharing. Women share a lot more versus men. Yeah. So is DBGI a model that a major would look to acquire? And if so, for which majors would be a good fit? I will just say that we've obviously been contacted by a lot of uh, big companies that are trying to figure out, especially what I'll call uh, mass luxury. So if you look at Amazon, they have done amazing. It took them forever to unlock apparel, but now that they've done well, it's really been in like what I call commodity, gold toe, Hanes, things like that, where, but when you get into what I call like Nordstrom's brands, everyone's really struggling. And I think in terms of just these e-commerce players to build out something, and so a lot of digital, like an Amazon, people like that, they're definitely, you know, very interested in getting into the space. And so the question is just when, how, why they will at some point. Um, but I do think that's obviously an opportunity for us. But I think we need to continue to just focus on building scale and proving out the model because then we can drive more of a return for shareholders. Last question. Uh, describe financially what you look for as far as cost and margins and type, different types of brands that you're trying to acquire. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think the first thing we look at is I think we believe most brands will be 50 to 150 million in revenue. We don't think you're going to see a whole lot of massive 250, 500 million dollar brands anymore. So number one is can they get there? If they can't, like the addressable market and the opportunity, is that possible? Um, then number two is even if they're a little bit smaller, how rabid is their fan base? Like, do they have a really high repeat rate? Uh, because if they don't have that or it's just kind of just one and done, that's also very expensive to scale because you're constantly acquiring new customers and it's like a leaky bucket. So if they can't even pass those first two, we don't get into the unit level economics. Then after that, we look at the unit level economics. And really, our belief is between after shipping, pick pack, cost goods sold, duties, everything, you need a 50 percent contribution margin. So if they can't get to 50 percent, then we need to probably really think how important this brand is to us because it is a big deal because the problem is, is you're going to need 20% of marketing into perpetuity because you have to be in so many channels. Now you have mm -hmm. to be in social, you have to be catalog, TV, radio. Uh, so it's not, it's not one channel when you're done. And so you really need 20%. So that leaves you 30%. And I, we would expect our GNA margins to get down to 10 to 12% over time, not now. But over time, and then we're running that 15% plus EBITDA. But that's so it's basically can it scale to 50 to 100 million? Number one. Number two is does it have a rapid and loyal fan base? And then number three is do the unit level economics work? Mm -hmm. Well, great presentation. We we really look forward to hearing all of your updates. Um, and thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank, thank you. you.
All right. It's been a great day so far. We're right in the middle. We're thrilled to present some more companies coming up in just a second. Remember, you're going to see a black screen for a moment as we move on to our next presenter, but stay with us. More fantastic emerging growth companies coming up in just a second.